up for FFCC. Go ahead. Hey, Kimberly, test point seven is complete. We had a good burn. Uh, radiometer peak values were about 125 or so for radiometer number one. And uh, the droplet burned down to about uh, 2.5 millimeters. Started off at 5 millimeters, went down to about 2.5, and it looks like it extinguished. It was hard for me to tell when the flame finally went out. Uh, looks like we got a little bit of sooting on top of the uh, black sand cover that was causing a little bit of a halo effect to me. So I wasn't sure uh, exactly when it extinguished, but I could tell that it wasn't burning any smaller. And at that point, we terminated it and turned the fan on. But it looked like a good burn. Okay, we copied all, Don, and I believe here on the ground they were watching and could tell, in fact, when uh, the, the droplet did stop burning. Please. Uh -huh. uh, you're not far from the damaged space station. It must be very bad feeling that you all are not able to help them. Is there, is there any way, uh, and let me uh, give this to Jim Halsell, is there any way you could help them if the problems on Mir got worse? Actually, uh, from our given orbit, we cannot get to the mirror. It's at a higher inclination orbit that we simply don't have the uh, the fuel to reach at this point. Uh, uh, we did have the opportunity, as you mentioned, to see mirror a few days ago, and actually I did not, but Susan did. So let me uh, let me pass it off to her and let you let you hear from her. Yeah, actually, Don and I saw mirror the other night, and it was spectacular. Mirror was the brightest thing in the sky, and she just passed almost directly overhead of us and almost close enough to reach out and touch them and yes of course we wish we could go help them unfortunately columbia can't get to that inclination yep. all right here's a viewer question from robert in england who uh, called in moments ago and he wants to know what the most spectacular thing you have seen so far on this mission is might be something in your space lab might be something out the window um, you can, uh, how about it, Roger Crouch, uh, could you take this, the most spectacular thing you have seen so far on this mission? We've got a bunch of people offering up opportunities. I'll go first. The, uh, I think the most spectacular thing I've seen on this mission compared to my previous flights are dust storms. There's a tremendous amount of dust blowing off the African continent right now, and it's headed uh, toward the west, toward North and South America. And to be able to see those plumes of dust, reach out those thousands of miles and know that it's actually what's happening in Africa is right now impacting the weather in Atlanta and all across the United States. It, it's an interesting and a privileged vantage point for us to have to be able to see that happening. Tell me who's doing the most work on the, uh, uh, on the fire experiments, the fire in space. This is a question specific to that. You can just pass the microphone over to the fire in space expert. Uh, and the question is, why are your experiments on fire in the combustion module so important during this mission? And what applications can these experiments have for those of us who probably will never get to fly in space, but who uh, have a lot of experience with fire down here on Earth? Well, you know, combustion is a very, very important part of our economy. Billi hundreds of billions of dollars a year are spent on energy, 90% of which comes from combustion. Uh, it's also a very important part of our foreign trade deficit. Uh, so if we can move the body of knowledge of combustion science forward, that can have broad ramifications in all areas of applied combustion science, automobiles, jet aircraft, power plants, all kinds of things that use combustion. And so the experiments we're trying to do up here, and they're, being very, they're very successful as well, is to uh, try and move the fundamental knowledge of combustion forward. Well, I'm glad everybody's surviving. Anybody else have any uh, any bad trouble uh, with adaptation syndrome, as uh, as the NASA speak is, or did most of you guys just kind of zoom through this? Yeah, I think the, uh, the the real data point on this whole flight is if you let a crew fly three months apart, the second time around, the adaptation is is very quick, uh, almost painless, I would call it. And I think that'll be a medical uh, point of interest for all the doctors back home because they, they've never really had uh, this number of people refly this quickly before, and I, and I know they're going to be interested in that. Uh, my interest now will be on landing to see if uh, what held true on coming into orbit also holds true on landing. That is, our readaptation to 1G is just as quick.
Columbia, Houston. We have a report of an on-time landing of Mars Pathfinder. Copy that, Bill. That's great news. You don't have video uh, for several more hours yet. Is that correct? Uh, Jim, that's correct. It's uh, it's starting to go through the process of uh, you know writing itself and uh, things like that. So uh, they're not anticipating even getting a signal uh, for an hour or so. Columbia, Houston. Uh, uh, yeah, Jim. I'm sorry. To, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, yeah, we just uh, we figured if you got to work on the Fourth of July, uh, this is uh, absolutely uh, the best thing to be involved with. We're real proud of you guys. <laughs> 